All right, the AK-74. I'm going to do a brief history on this rifle and the difference between it and the AK-47. Both of these firearms were made way back in the day. I built them myself from parts kits, okay, that arrived in this country before they changed the laws and stuff. Um, what happened was after the fall of communism, a lot of these countries went to NATO. The AK-47 was built in Romania, even though it has a different four-stock. I changed that pistol grip thing out. And this AK-74 was made in Bulgaria. These guns were uh, cut up. They destroyed the receivers, and then you had guns that came in as parts kits with all the parts except the receivers. And these Bulgarian AK-74s, a bunch of these were mint. These were mint unfired guns. Okay. So for a period of time, you could buy these. You could assemble them as a kit yourself, and eventually companies started uh, assembling these guns from the kits. And that's when you had the compliance, so many parts, nine parts or whatever, and all this other stuff. And uh, I don't really know. I know someone still builds new ones and still has them today, but this was back in the heyday uh, years ago, and that's where they come from. So, now, on to the history of the AK-74. In the early 70s, the Russians decided they wanted to catch up to the U.S. They wanted a rifle that fired the uh, smaller caliber than 30. It would be like down in the 22 calibers. They wanted a small caliber uh, with a high velocity to be on par. And just about every military has adopted something. And it comes down to where it's the same round which NATO uses. It's a universal round that goes in the uh, M16 and M4s. Uh, and you also had this Russian round, the uh, 5.45 by 39 millimeter. Now the Russians developed this, a team of engineers developed this round. And they had Kalashnikov, and he said there was nothing wrong with his AK-47, that if they did some designs to the ammunition, they would not have to change the gun. Well, they made him redo it, and we ended up with the AK-74. Now, they say that parts, 30% or 40% of the parts can be used. Well, it's, I, in my opinion, that's not true. What they did is they rescaled, he rescaled the gun down. Now the early versions were made with laminate wood, okay, and they had metal magazines. This one here came with the Polish version. This is a steel mag, okay. The very early variants were made like that, just like the AK-47. Now, if you notice the magazines on the two, because of the diameter of the body of the cartridge, the AK-47 has that taper there, where or the curvature is greater, and this is more straight here on this magazine. And you can see that that's evident. See it here? We'll put this one up there. So magazines are different. Different look to them. And like I said, the early ones, it was just different caliber, different thing. They also changed the muzzle brake. Now, they come up with this simple muzzle brake for the AK-47, where they came up with this complex one where there's, you know, it hits a steel plate, so that pushes the recoil impulse forward, and then you have this big thing that blasts outside. So they redesigned a muzzle brake on there. And it wasn't until the mid-80s uh, they started using, I believe it's a type of fiberglass in uh, your handguards here. And also, if you notice, on both sides of this buttstock is this, uh, like, dished-out section on this side and the other. And they asked Kalashnikov after the fall of communism, they went over and interviewed him, that is to make the weapon lighter. 
Okay, that's actually molded in there. It's, it's a lightning to make the gun lighter. The gun is much lighter. The Russian military wanted a more modernized weapon where the soldiers could carry more ammo and high velocity, small caliber, we'll say, which is standard with everyone in uh, the world. Now, most of the world armies. And, you know, same deal with the AK. You got a different butt plate, but cleaning kits in there, cleaning rod is underneath, sling mounts are the same, you can use the same sling, um, sights are the same, you use the same tools, and it disassembles and functions just like the AK-47. This gun is lighter, then as they went on using, instead of wood, the fiberglass, the gun became lighter, and then they decided to use a form of resin. Some people call it Bakelite, but it's kind of not. They actually started using these uh, synthetic magazines, which is lighter. Now, interestingly enough, even though they designed this cartridge and it was called the poison bullet because the way the bullet was designed, um, the jacketing would deform and shatter with the steel rod that's in the middle and there was a small air pocket in the nose and the Afghans call it the poison bullet when you hit a human being or a living creature with this cartridge it causes a horrible wound it tumbles but the Soviets realized that they were not achieving their goal of <clears throat> the high velocity to penetrate body armor, Kevlar, helmets this gun kind of failed, the ammunition did, so there were several different changes to the ammo, which the ATF outlawed all of them as uh, armor-piercing um, handgun ammo, so you can't get any of the ori original Russian-style ammo with the... Uh, they actually ended up putting tungsten carbide cores in the bullets, so that was another interesting thing. Okay, we'll kind of flip them over and take a look at the other side. Take another look at them. As you see, the sights are quite similar. Okay, and how it works. You get a better look at the muzzle brake and that simple Soviet one with just a angled cut. It's like uh, to keep the muzzle from climbing in full auto fire. And there were several other little small changes. There's a spring-loaded washer here on the upper hand guard, and uh, several other minor modifications between the two weapons. And over the years, these have been changed. They, uh, the Russians still use them, and they are different. Uh, they mount grenade launchers on them underneath, just like the M203. And I think. The more modern versions have rails to where they can mount optic sights. And there is a version of this that came with a folding stock. And uh, I don't have one of those. But they do have a more modernized version of it too. With, uh, it looks like a, it's a folding stock, but it looks like a M4 collapsible. So, you know, you can modify them. But this is basically the mid-80s. Probably the lightest using the synthetic uh, plastic furniture in that. This gun is considerably lighter than the AK-47. Like I said, lightweight, lightweight mags, ammo, everything, furniture, getting it down. Uh, when you compare the recoil impulse from the rifles, the AK-74, I did mention it in another video, is hardly any recoil impulse. The, uh, it's lighter than the M16A1 or 2, and both of those are significantly lighter than the AK-47. Alright, so that's a look at the gun. The gun disassembles just like the AK-47, so it's the same thing 
but if you notice side to side the parts are probably a little bit more scaled down it operates the same way you throw the lever up safe everything else um, if the parts were different dimensionally inside I, I'm not quite sure uh, these guns all had to have the full auto hammer and trigger replaced with semi-automatic ones and these civilian guns the whole positioning for the uh, fire control is slightly different than a full auto gun also I believe not quite sure but there you go there's a look at it uh, really neat thing to have part of military history oh yeah and the other thing about it the Russians is a military tactic uh, don't let any information about any of their equipment out and we really here in the West did not know about this gun of course probably wasn't really in service long when they invaded Afghanistan in 1979 uh, some say, you know, that the CIA paid uh, Mujahideen money for one. But I remember seeing these guns for the first time in Soldier Fortune magazine, run by Colonel Robert Brown. And uh, somehow, he either had pictures or he got a hold of them. He had his people over there in Afghanistan. And those were the first photographs of the ammunition, the gun, and everything else that was seen at least in the US, at least to me when I was a teenager. Uh, so Soldier of Fortune got a hold of them first. And that's when uh, they were trying, you know, our government was trying to get examples to study this weapon and the ammunition behind it. So that's kind of the history of it. And I will take this out. I will make a video of me shooting this. Uh, and a couple more. I'll go over accessories and bayonets and other shorter videos. Okay. Thanks for watching.